Watch out. Okay, I, I like your attitude. <laughs> We're going to go ahead and get started. Thanks for coming tonight. I'm going to go ahead and call this July 16th, 2018 meeting of the Whitefish City Council to order. We will start with our uh, Pledge of Allegiance, and I will, who wants to lead us in the pledge tonight? How about that? Mark? Thank you, Mark. We'll move on to item three of our agenda, and that's a presentation from Whitefish Soul Smart, a word presentation. I'm told that it is in the mail, okay. and so we should have a presentation on this at a future meeting. Okay. Thanks, Greg. Yep. We'll skip it for now. We'll move on to item four then, communications from the public. We do have... Two public hearings scheduled for tonight. I want to remind uh, the audience that we did um, postpone item 7C of the agenda, which was a resolution of intent to adopt the Whitefish 57 Eagle Enterprises Area subplan. That's been postponed to the August 6th, 2018 meeting at the request of uh, the applicant. So we will have two public hearings tonight. This is not the opportunity now to comment on the public hearings. If you have anything in addition you'd like to bring to the council's attention, now would be your opportunity. If you're here for those specific public uh, hearings, please wait till we call those individual hearings. Is there any public comment tonight? Mark. Hello, my name is Mark Van Everen. I live at uh, Four Pine Avenue here in town. And I just wanted to um, uh, comment on the upcoming discussion for the impact fees. And um, uh, I guess I just want to urge council to use some caution in regards to, you know, increasing our costs for building. Um, and uh, if there's, um, I know that you divide up the impact fees in a variety of different ways, um, you know, city hall, emergency services, park maintenance building, and so forth. Um, but at the end of the day, what um, uh, we do is, as builders, um, we write one check, um, and uh, often the one check appears to be startling to folks uh, when they need to uh, write that check before you even break ground or, you know, do anything. And uh, I would just urge uh, council to make sure that, you know, if we if we need to increase the fees, great, we need to do that. But if in-house we've got a, our belt is tight and uh, uh, everything is um, the way it should be, um, then fine, we can increase fees, but I guess I would want to urge folks to look at, you know, the big picture of both the uh, cost for construction here in town and uh, make sure that it's well warranted uh, and that there's not other places, you know, throughout um, uh, the, the city jurisdiction whereby we can, you know, you know, trim, trim some uh, excess uh, before looking out to the public to, or the developers to, you know, bear that fee. So thanks a bunch. Thanks, Mark. Further public comment tonight. We'll stay with the audience. Any volunteer board reports from the audience? How about the council? Katie. The Whitefish Strategic Housing Committee met last Thursday and the, everyone's kind of trekking along on all of the amendments that we're trying to make or updates uh, regarding some of the strategic planning, mostly due with the planning board. But one thing that did come through is we have selected Homeward to actually help come forward to do a site plan development with the public to see for the snow lot to see what we could potentially get out of that site and involve the public. Dates will be discussed and we will reach out to invite everyone in to provide their input and discuss what the community wants to see uh, at the snow lot for affordable housing. And I will keep you updated on those dates. 
Thanks, Katie. Further volunteered volunteer board reports from the council. Not seeing any, we'll move on to our consent agenda. Any changes or additions to the July 2nd meeting minutes or can I have a motion for approval? I'd move to approve the consent agenda. <laughs> Is there a second to the motion? A second. Seconded by Councillor Williams. Further discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand. And those opposed, like sign, and the motion carries unanimously. Michelle? Which does bring us on to our two public hearings this evening. We actually do have Homeward present in the audience for a brief presentation on item 7A of our agenda, which is a consideration for an application to the Montana Department of Commerce for a home investment partnership program grant for a new 38 unit affordable multifamily housing complex. Um, and we would entertain public comment this evening on the needs of our community. Welcome. Lori? Okay. Uh, good evening, Council. Uh, again, my name is Heather McMillan. I'm the Housing Development Director at Homeward. Uh, I know it's not the right time, but thank you um, for the nod at Snowlot. We're excited to work with the city um, on that project. To not confuse the issue, we'll shift gears entirely and talk about uh, the Edgewood property uh, that we're working with the Housing Authority, uh, Whitefish Housing Authority on. I've never really stand up here and apologize, but I'm gonna to apologize to this group because the public hearings we're having are technical and we need to go on the record. Um, and you all know that housing is a great need in Whitefish and uh, have supported this project in full, uh, but we're going through the technical uh, piece of the uh, Montana Department of Commerce home application where we notify the juris local jurisdiction that we are going to submit a home application, and then we invite the public to comment on that. Um, and I know how invested you've been as a community for many years and where this project is coming from with the low-income housing tax credits and the project coming to fruition, but we would like and hope that council, as members of the community and anybody in the audience, uh, could go on the record and uh, show that uh, affordable housing is in need in Whitefish um, from a technicality standpoint. Um, and we're here to answer any questions. And also I can give you a project update after we solicit public comment. Or now, in whichever order you prefer. Please proceed. <laughs> uh, we did not just come up to take five minutes of your time. Uh, we spent the day in um, assessing architect proposals. Um, we had seven architecture firms respond to our request for qualifications. And we did five interviews today. and. We still haven't figured out who we're gonna hire, but we're gonna spend the night stewing on it. We should know by later this week who we'll be hiring, but I'll let you know that there's a lot of interest and a lot of passion behind um, working on a project here in Whitefish, Montana. So uh, you're, you'll be pleased with whoever we select. We have a lot of good, uh, a lot of potentials. Um, and we're also uh, sat with Ben and Lori, um, worked through those proposals, so we're doing that as a collective. So we should have more updates um, soon. Uh, we're working full steam ahead solicit the architects, and then they will attend and listen as part of our community design charrette that we're hosting on August 16th, more details to come, uh, where we'll be reaching out with project knowns and soliciting feedback on building types, site use, um, other uh, potential, po uh, the potential pieces of that project to really shape how it looks in the community. So be, have the architects on board, more to come on the 16th of August. Um, we're really excited about the project. So we're progressing quickly toward a submission to the Montana Board of Housing for an application. I think I've been here, but maybe I haven't been. We were invited to submit an application, so that's really great. <laughs> and that is due um, on August 27th. So that's the quick and uh, dirty update on the project, but really excited about the progress we're making. Okay. Thanks, Heather. Appreciate your time tonight. Mm -hmm. We did advertise for a public hearing on what will be item 7A of our agenda. Is there any public comment tonight related to our city's affordable housing program and the needs of our community? Any public comments? Not seeing any, I will go ahead and close the public hearing and we do not need action from the council tonight on this item, but is there anything else you'd like to share with us, Heather? Um, no, we'll continue to give you guys updates and more to come about that charrette. And I'm assuming with all the commitments you've made as council and also residents of Whitefish that you think affordable housing is a need in Whitefish, Montana. And you could go on the record as individuals and state, state that. I don't know if that is appropriate or not, but it would be nice to get some sort of feedback um, 
on the, on the record. Okay, who would like to start with the positive feedback related to affordable housing? Katie. I'm very excited to see that we have been considered for this LIHTC project. The city of Whitefish and the community has been working uh, time and time again for the past couple of years to try and solve a lot of our affordable housing and workforce housing needs, which we're in dire straits right now. And this is one step forward to kind of help address the spectrum of housing needs that we need within this town, both for ownership, for rental, across a variety of different economic um, means. So very much appreciate it, and I support this project. Thanks, Katie. Further comments from the council? Melissa. I'll just add, I know that if you go door to door in this town, um, you, will have, you will meet a lot of people that feel that affordable housing is a huge concern. Um, everyone from business owners to um, individuals who are looking for affordable housing. Um, you'll find people that have to relocate because they can't find affordable housing in this town. So um, I appreciate the work that you're doing and I think it's a huge need in our community. So thank, thank you. I'll speak briefly. I've been up here long enough to where, and I think Andy could probably speak to this better than I can, where we've batted around voluntary inclusionary zoning now for 15 plus years in our community. We've gone from 5% cash in lieu to 10% cash in lieu, back to 8% cash in lieu, and we've probably built six units over the last 15 years since at least I've been serving Andy, I'm sure, even longer. Um, with that said, I think we're, we're certainly committed to this um, goal for our city having adopted our housing needs assessment and certainly our strategic plan. So we look forward to working with Homeward and the community on developing a project or projects throughout our community. So Same. thanks very much, Heather. Yeah. And, and thank you. And again, I apologize for having you go on the record, but I really appreciate it. And I know how hard you guys have worked as a community for many years. We're thrilled to be working with you as well. So thank you. Thank you. Travel safe. We will move on to item 7B, which is a request by Robert and Heather McCulloch for a conditional use permit to construct an accessory apartment at 303 O'Brien Avenue, which is zone WR4, which is our high density multifamily residential district. And this is on page 52 of your packet. Bailey. Good evening. So the applicant is requesting a conditional use permit to construct an accessory apartment adjacent to an existing single family residence. The apartment would be located above a proposed two car garage at the rear of the subject property. There is an existing garage that's currently on the property, and that is actually proposed to be removed. It would be a 100% new, um, new build. Um, the new garage would be approximately 24 feet wide by 25 feet long to meet the total 600 square foot uh, maximum size. A separate stairway with an exterior door that's actually on the inside of the garage would be proposed to access the apartment. It would be set back um, the minimum six feet from the southern side property line, six feet along the eastern rear property line, um, and then it would have to meet 10 feet along the street sides as well. We don't allow that reduction on the street side. Um, there is an existing approach off of 3rd Street and that would actually be continued to access the new garage. So the subject property does comply with our minimum lot size requirement at 6,500 square feet. Um, it is currently, as I said, developed with a single family residence. Um, it is surrounded by residential uses on, on all sides. Um, only to the north is actually WB3. The rest of it is all WR4 in that surrounding area. Um, as the mayor stated, it is zone WR4, which is our high density multifamily residential district. Um, the growth policy designation for the area is urban. That actually doesn't comply with the WR4. Um, that's more for our WLR, WR1, WR2. Um, it's been that way for years. I'm not sure why it was never matched up when the growth policy came in. Um, it will be connected to all city services and utilities. Uh, we did mail a notice to the adjacent landowners within 150 feet of the property. We also emailed advisory agencies, placed the legal in the paper. When I wrote the staff report, I haven't had any um, comments on the project. Um, there was one comment at planning board, and I'll get to that in a little bit. Um, so the growth policy criteria, as I said, the, the WR4 zoning, um, it's it's compliant with the density, or excuse me, with the growth policy designation of urban um, because it is in association, in association with a single family residence, which does correspond to the same standards and ideals um, that we do see in the WLR, WR1, and WR2. But again, it doesn't actually comply with our urban um, designation definition in the future growth policy. Um, it is consistent with the purpose and intent of our regulations for accessory apartments. Um, do, do, do. 
Uh, adequate parking will be provided. They are required to um, provide one parking space for the accessory apartment, two for the residential use. They are showing two in the garage, and then they do have two that would be in the driveway for the stacked parking, which does comply with our regulations at this time. Um, that also will be confirmed at the time of building permit to make sure that the spaces do meet the right size when they do come in for their building permit application. Um, mm -hmm. And again, the lot does meet our minimum lot size and minimum lot width requirements for the WR4 zoning. Um, lot coverage will be confirmed again at the time of building permit. Um, the zoning district does allow 40% lot coverage. Um, the access, as I said, it, will, it already has an access off a of third street that will continue. Um, mm -hmm. I'm trying to just hit the highlights and I know you all have read it, but just kind of the highlights here. Um, water sewer connections are required for the accessory apartment. As I said, it is currently connected to all city services, so that will maintain. Um, traffic impacts are anticipated to be minimal. It does have an existing single family residence. It's in an existing neighborhood that has many of the same uses occurring in that area. Um, and it should not result in a significant impact um, increase on traffic on either O'Brien or Third Street. Um, the proposed driveway will be paved as required in our zoning regulation, so that is something um, that will be required at the time of building permit as well. Um, as I said, it's accessory to a single family home similar to adjacent residential uses in the area. Um, the majority of the homes in the area are single family. There are some multifamily, actually right across the street from this property is a multifamily unit that I believe has four units in it. It's that green one that's kind of on the corner. Um, so it is kind of a mixed mixed density in that area as well. Um, so it does, does kind of fit that character for an additional unit. Um, it's not expected to impact or change the character of this area, um, and it is structured, will be built in, um, in compliance or, or similar character to the other buildings that are in that area. So, I'm not good at ad-libbing, sorry. I should just stick to reading it. <laughs> um, so, uh, staff recommended approval of the conditional use permit to 13 conditions. Um, as I said, the planning board met on June 21st and considered the request. There was one member of the public that spoke at the meeting, um, and they actually had some more questions, I think, than really comments on it. Um, and those draft minutes are included as part of your packet as well. Um, following the hearing, the planning board voted five to one um, in favor to recommend approval to the city council. Um, and I can address further questions if you have, so. Any questions for Bailey? Frank. Bailey, you said mm -hmm. you were going to go into some comments that have been delivered at that planning board. Oh, it was just the one public, the pu one public comment that was there, um, and they, like I said, they weren't, they weren't against it. Um, they really mainly just had some questions, um, more about nightly, weekly rentals in the area and if that zoning allowed for it. So it wasn't, it wasn't opposed to the project at all. It was just more of questions of the general zoning district. So. Further questions for Bailey on her staff report. Not seeing any. Okay. Thanks, Bailey. Not seeing any. We did advertise for a public hearing on what will be item 7B of our agenda, and we'll hold that public hearing now. Doug, do you have anything to add on behalf of the applicant? Not really, unless you have some questions. We're here to okay. Thank you. Any public comment tonight on this item? Good evening. My name is Riley Columbus. I also, uh, Riley is a nickname, of course, which most of you know me by, but Christina is my official name. And I live at 327 O'Brien. Um, so I did receive the materials on this. I did call and ask a question, but I think I called the wrong person at the city and never heard back. But in any case, I think that um, what I've been reading about this, I am in support of this. Um, as far as the character of the neighborhood, I do agree that it goes along. Um, however, I just wanted to point out that because of our uh, boundary being so close to the nightly rental zones, um, I think it's important for us to keep an eye on properties such as this. Um, on the one hand, I think it's a great, this is within the plan of our affordable housing and accessory units may be used for that in the future, which is, I think, a really good thing. Um, it's something I'm even considering as far as what is on my property, so I'm paying close attention to this one. Um, there are other uh, units in the in the vicinity that have been pushing the whole vacation rental 30-day thing, 
and uh, the city has taken good care of, of following up on some of the requests of myself and other neighbors on one of those units, and they're following the rules now. Um, but there's also the, the unique uh, nature of our economy, which shows that people will come and stay in units for uh, 30 days or even 60 days or 90 days in the summertime, and they're not necessarily uh, homeowners, nor are they, uh, you know, permanent residents of that nature. So just something to, to keep in mind. And um, as far as I understand from from my relations with the with this couple, I did meet them briefly last summer, or at least I met him. Uh, it sounds like the, their plan is to is to live on the site and then rent out this. So my hope is that they uh, are actually someone who's going to be part of this neighborhood and, and contribute to the neighborhood in a positive way and and that this unit will be something that hopefully in the future will serve a need for people who are working in our community. Thank you. Thanks, Riley. Appreciate the comments tonight. Further public comment on this item? Not seeing any, I'll go ahead and close the public hearing and turn it back to council for a motion. Katie. I would move to approve WCUP 18-08, the findings of fact in the staff report and the 13 conditions of approval as recommended by the Whitefish Planning Board on June 21st, 2018. I'll second. Seconded by Councillor Hennan. Further discussion on the motion? All those in favor, please raise your hand and those opposed like sign. And that carries unanimously as well, Michelle. Thanks. We'll move quickly on to item eight of our agenda, which is communications from our planning um, and building director. You have enclosed in the packet a consideration of approving an application from Glacier Ranch Holdings for Whitefish Lake and Lakeshore Protection Permit WLP 18 WS6, located at 1990 East Lakeshore Drive for the removal of existing cabin and outhouse from the Lakeshore Protection Zone. Removal of four trees and revegetation of the Lakeshore Protection Zone following completion. Bailey. Hi. So this has been a long time in coming to you guys. So um, I'm going to go through my transmittal and then I'm happy um, to go through kind of the background and give some more information on this project because it's been going on for a while. Um, so as the mayor stated, this is a request for a standard lakeshore construction permit to move an existing um, partially reconstructed cabin outside of the lakeshore protection zone and the water quality protection zone in order to bring the property into compliance with our city regulations. Um, the cabin is approximately 402 and a half square feet. Um, they're also proposing to remove an existing outhouse um, that I believe is inside the outside the lakeshore protection zone but within the water quality protection area um, and they are proposing to hook it up to city sewer as well um, they also would be um, obtaining a building permit for their new foundation so they're getting a building permit we're getting them to hook up to city water and sewer um, is kind of a, a, a really good deal in this case. Um, in order to facilitate the removal of the cabin from the Lakeshore Protection Zone, um, they are requesting to remove one tree from the Lakeshore Protection Zone. Um, there were three other trees um, that they applied for, but those trees are actually outside of the Lakeshore Protection Zone, um, so they're not, they don't need a permit from us in order to do that. Um, they would be requiring an excavator to move the cabin, and they would also take out those existing big stone foundations that are in the, um, that are pretty much below high water, actually. Um, so I'm gonna kind of skip my transmittal letter and go more to the staff report, because there's some more information in that as well. I can find my copy of it. Oh, hold on, I lost my copy. Yeah because that gives some more background information. And then I'll go back to the Lakeshore um, Protection Committee and kind of go through that part. So, um, so the cabin was originally constructed in 1940, and that's according to the state CAMA data. Um, they, let's see, where was it? Um, oh, I skipped, sorry, excuse me. So the property was annexed into the city limits in November, uh, November 6th of 2017. Um, this was not at the request of the property owner. This was part of that Houston um, drive, wholly annexation, annexed, wholly surrounded annexation <laughs> area. I gotta slow down. Um, Prior to that, the Flathead County Planning Office did permit um, a lakeshore permit for the remodel of the cabin, and that was in February 6th of 2017. So it was prior to our annexation. Um, 
Then on December 4th, so after we've annexed it, December 4th, um, the Flathead County Planning Office, they issued a stop work order on the reconstruction of the project. Um, they had some comments received from some neighbors that the project was actually bigger in scope and they were changing the height and changing some of the other aspects, um, not in accordance with their permit. When they issued the stop work order, they realized, oh, hey, the city's annexed this and basically shipped it off to us and said, here you go, you get to deal with the violation now. Um, so we issued our own stop work order on December 22nd, um, and we did it because they did not obtain a valid floodplain permit, um, which is a requirement under both the city and the county um, uh, regulations um, when a non-conforming building and the floodplain is reconstructed to more than 50% of its value. Um, so basically the city was kind of put in, in a hard plot, in a hard spot. We can't issue a floodplain permit because it's in violation of our regulations. Um, it can't meet our city lakeshore protection regulations because it's a dwelling unit below high water. We don't allow them at all in that area. Um, what do we what do we do? You know, what, what's the outcome for that? Um, so on January 4th, we did approve an action plan. Um, they had requested to dry it in for the winter um, so we could try to figure out what What's our next step to do? Where do we take this from here? Um, so we conditionally approved it with eight conditions. One is that it was supposed to be removed by May 1st. Um, they requested a two month extension um, of the, uh, excuse me, they requested a two month extension to that removal. Um, and we granted that because they were coming in, I don't know if you remember, they came in for a boundary line adjustment so that where the new cabin, where it's being pulled off, will meet all of our zoning requirements as well. Um, and then they were working through this permit. They knew they needed to get a lakeshore permit. We needed to have more discussion. So we did grant that extension. Um, it was actually until July 1st. Um, so they we're kind of out of that extension, but they are, again, they are working for, we were trying to come up with a, a, a plan to deal with this. Um, so we took the request to the Lakeshore Committee. Um, we, or excuse me, I should say, so staff recommended approval of the application um, subject to 20 conditions. Um, we took it to the Lakeshore Committee. There were some members of the public that were there. We actually, I thought it was a really great discussion um, about what, what we were looking at possible future plans as we know, rumors that we hear around, we haven't heard anything. Um, and I did attach those draft minutes, but I thought it was a really actually a great discussion with some of the property owners and trying to get everybody on the same page. Um, in the end, the, the Lakeshore Committee, um, they ended up, they recommended approval of the application, but with a condition that no trees be removed for the project. Um, and so in making that, they actually are proposing to strike staff's conditions 16 through 20. Um, and I hope on my exhibit, I've tried to, ex that it shows kind of what they were proposing to strike. Um, so after the decision from the Lakeshore Committee, the applicant's representative, um, they actually went back on on site. They measured there's two trees that are involved. Um, this tree that's actually Michelle has posted with the pink ribbon around it, that is the tree that they want to save. That is a ponderosa um, pine tree that's there that actually they were hoping to save. The actual one they want to remove, um, it's a dug fir, it's on the other side. Um, they measured theirs, a, yeah, it's that one kind of right there by the corner that Michelle put up there. Um, there's approximately one foot of clearance between the two trees um, that they would have to move this cabin out. Um, it does seem possible that it can be removed, the cabin removed without the tree removals, um, but definitely the applicant has some concerns. <coughs> Um, that they either put, might potentially damage it if the cabin shifts even slightly with the excavator pulling it out, that it could hit the tree. You know, there's a lot of um, variables that could take into that account with doing this. Um, they are willing to attempt the, re the removal of the cabin without the tree being removed, um, but they wanted the opportunity basically that if, if it became unavoidable or if there was an issue um, that that either staff could come out and approve it beforehand or that they may be able to bring it back to council for consideration um, about that tree removal as well. So I drafted up a proposed condition um, in the exhibit. And so my proposed condition is condition number, I know there's multiple 16s, but it's under um, recommended conditions proposed by staff, that one that I've underlined as kind of a, I have a medium or a, a middle ground kind of area where we could go out and assess, see what it is, and if it's required for them to get this cabin out, that they could take that tree down. So, um, but hopefully we're progressing in the forward manner. So I'm happy to answer questions um, if you have any as well. Um, Thanks, Bailey. Yeah. Any questions for Bailey on her staff report? 
Not seeing any. Uh -huh. Discussion, okay. motion? I will say I've kind of been following this from the, the periphery, getting emails and some of the legal correspondence that went back and forth between the city and Glacier Ranch Holdings attorneys, which I believe were from out of state. And I just wanted to thank uh, Bailey for her diligence and seeing this through to what's a great outcome for both the lake as well as the property owner, in my opinion, and the city. So uh, thanks, Bailey, for um, seeing this through to completion. And with that, I will take a motion. Andy. I would move to approve WLP 18-W06 um, with the conditions proposed by city staff, including additional conditions regarding any potential tree removal if deemed necessary during construction. And I'll speak to that if I get a second. Is there a second to the motion? I'll second. Seconded by Councillor Williams. Andy. Um, well, I certainly appreciate the Lakeshore Protection Committee's input on this. I think the overall big goal here is to get that building out of the Lakeshore <laughs> Protection Zone. and. If they can't get it between those two trees, then I don't know what they do. And then I think we've sort of lost sight of the trees for the forest or forest for the trees or something like that. So um, my guess is they're going to do everything they can to get it through there and probably leave the tree standing because you know, I know I have trees on my lot and I like them. But I would hope they would be able to do that. But if not, I think anybody that's been by that building on the lake should understand that it needs to go. So anyway, that's the reason I think that the staff proposal is the best, so. Thanks, Andy. Further discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand. And those opposed, like sign, and that carries unanimously as well, Michelle. Which brings us quickly on to item 9A, communications from Dana, our finance director. We have a follow-up review of our findings from the final report prepared by FCS Group for our impact fee final report. Dana. Thank you. Um, so at our last work session, um, I presented the final reports. Um, I did indicate that we had some numbers we were still trying to work through um, that we were provided for occupancy rates. Um, First, I'll, I'll get into the presentation. We'll touch on that as we go through. Um, we will have a new final report that will be updated reflecting those numbers. Um, so at the work session, we really went over, um, tried to focus in on the detail of the three impact fees that are going up. Um, all the ones that have a maximum defensible amount that's uh, less than our current rates have to go down to at least that maximum defensible amount. Um, so the ones that we focused on uh, was wastewater, um, the park maintenance building and the paved trails. Uh, wastewater is pretty explanatory with the um, new wastewater treatment plant, but paved trails and the park maintenance building, there was a, a pretty significant shift in the um, assessment of that fee, which would now include commercial development and lodging facilities and not just single family residences. So it shares the burden of um, basically visitors uh, that uh, visit hotels, um, as well as you know, commercial development with apartments would still have demand for those facilities. So in preparing for the next steps, uh, staff would like some direction regarding the impact fee rate changes to propose for the upcoming hearing. Um, kind of don't want to go through the entire process of preparing the, um, the, the ordinance, but also all the work papers that we have to have to implement a rate increase. Um, we'd like to at least have a good idea of what your, your feelings are, because there are some significant increases um, that could be proposed. Um, staff uh, recommended at the last meeting to implement the paved trail impact fee, only 50% of the maximum defensible. Um, so that would be uh, $1,290 roughly for a single family residence. Um, Craig did also calculate uh, for me the, uh, an example, a lodging facility and then an apartment complex. As you can see, uh, they both roughly are going up about $20,000. And if you were to look at paved trails, there's your kicker. Um, other than that, it's wastewater. Um, but I, I do feel that that one's important as we look toward the uh, wastewater treatment plant uh, expansion. Did a little bit more analysis on the paved trails, and while 50%, I think, is possible, um, I do think that you also have wiggle room to go down to a 25% temporarily. Um, the 50% was calculated of what we need is um, for any paved trails that we do in the future of the, the 20 years that we have for the bike ped plan, 54% of those have to be funded 
with other money. And what I looked at was resort tax, and that's assuming we used all of the resort tax for paved trails, then yes, 50% is absolutely a good number. Um, but we know that the, the 5% of the original 2% that parks gets also goes to park improvements. So we don't usually use all of it for paved trails. We're seeing a little bit of a shift. You'll see in the CIP, we are increasing some funding there. We have some funding from TIF, so we do have other sources. But you know, just wanted to gauge based on what you see as the examples um, in front of you or within my reports, um, the single family homes would be facing at a 50% uh, implementation for paved, tra paved trails, they would be looking at a, um, a $1,281 increase roughly. That's a four bedroom, three bath home, um, 33 water uh, fixtures, 27 sewer, um, and a three quarter inch meter. Um, so, there, so there's that part with the kind of the, the fee side. Um, I feel like a uh, maximum defensible amount is something you can work toward, uh, but we are required to review this every five years. So um, <clears throat> this isn't set in stone, so in the next five years we can review it, look at it, see where we came with the uh, bike ped master plan, um, and then move forward there. Rates have not been increased since 2007. Uh, they were decreased in 2013 for single family homes, uh, very slightly to account for, um, I think it's the lower number of fixtures, I believe some, somehow there was a calculation there that brought it down slightly. Um, if we were to go at the 50% rate, uh, you're looking at a single family home of 7,943 compared to Kalispell would be 9,466. So still less than Kalispell. Columbia Falls obviously doesn't have impact fees. They have um, connection fees, but they are not the same. Uh, Missoula would be 6,360 and Bozeman is 9,145. So again, we're, we're right there in the ballpark for everything. Um, and then the kind of last um, direction that I would like just to confirm that a January 1 effective date would be something you're interested in. I think it would be great to, uh, to, to defer it until that date and to allow for the current construction projects to be completed or get through the process. Because they, I know that they have you know, financial planning that they're doing for these projects, so um, to throw a wrench in it, in the middle and peak of construction season, um, I would see as um, we would probably hear more comments about it. Um, so if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. In the uh, packet, <coughs> I've included the um, report from FCS group as well as the PowerPoint presentation that I had. And if you have any questions about the PowerPoint presentation, I'm happy to answer them. Thanks, Dana. Katie. Quick question. If we were to drop the uh, the paved trails to 25%, what is that dollar amount? I want to double check my math. Yep, so if you're looking like at the examples you have in front of you, mm -hmm. um, the paved trails, that's 50% increase, so if you dropped it by half. Yep, okay. That's what I thought, but yeah. I just wanted to. Yep, get yep. and then record. same for like a single family home. Um, it would go down from the uh, 1290 to, what is that, 645, I think. Yeah. <laughs> I have to use a Thank calculator, you. so. So we'll need to go ahead and have a motion that speaks to both direction on the recommendations for the individual fees as well as the effective date of January 1, 2019. And as a reminder, this will come back to the council at the first meeting in October via ordinance for formal adoption. Katie. I will make a motion and I can also speak to this motion if I get a second. Um, I will move to approve the impact fees as presented before us with the exception of dropping the paved trails to a 25% fee for the time being. And then following through with everything else as presented within your report. Is there a second to the motion? I'll second. Seconded by Councillor Hennen. Katie, would you like to speak to your motion? I do. I, Maria, I love the parks. I love the parks department. Um, and I've gone back and forth on this quite a bit. But I just, given the fact that we're preaching affordability in the city of Whitefish, and then we're trying to increase impact fees, and I understand that we haven't done it in a while and it's necessary, I think if we can kind of cut costs a little bit to start out with and then reassess within five years, I think this is a place to do it. Also given the fact that we have to reassess how we are gonna pay for these trails. And the fact of the matter is, is the maintenance of paved trails and to 
build the trails is very expensive and this doesn't cover that cost. And so it's kind of one of those cost benefit analysis of, well, yeah, we can get the money, but then are we actually gonna be able to build them and how much is it gonna cost to maintain them? And so if we can kind of decrease the burden a little bit on not only the home buyer, who, whose price will be jacked up because we've jacked up impact fees, increased, not jacked up, excuse me, increased impact fees, then I think that that's kind of, that's a, that's a meeting in the middle because we do need to have the wastewater treatment plant numbers go up. We're paying for a very expensive mandated wastewater treatment plant and that just is the nature of the beast and that can kind of help qualm some of the fees in other areas. But in terms of paved trails, I see that this is one area where we could meet in the middle with the affordability issue. Thanks, Katie. Further comments on the motion? Andy. Um, yeah, I'm going to vote against it because I think the trails are extremely important. And if I look at it, $645 is $645. I realize that, but it's not a huge sum in comparison to the rest of what's there. And the big hitter, as you said, is wastewater. And for the most part, everything else has gone down significantly. And and I just I did a bunch of errands around town using the trails on my bike on Saturday, and you know. They are very, very important to this community for many, many, many reasons. And I think that it's short-sighted if we don't put the money in the bank and we'll find the funding sources. I'm confident of that. And a lot of times, if we don't have the money in the bank and we can't meet the match, then we're not going to get the funding because that's the way we tend to do a lot of those things. And so I just would be concerned. And it's I hear what Mark says, and I agree with him, but affordability is a, a lot of things it's not just the upfront cost also so I'm gonna vote against the motion thanks Andy further comments Frank uh, and the only other thing I would say Katie is I I hear what you're saying I hear what Mark is saying and six hundred what dollars is is six hundred dollars I get that but on projects of these size I don't think we've moved the needle for affordability necessarily and the other is that I think we are going to consider at some point here as we go forward when we have affordable housing projects uh, that come to us and need relief on some of these things. I think that's one of the tools we're going to put in our toolbox, as I understand it. So I don't think that this will necessarily impact affordability as it relates to affordable housing. But that's my, my sense of it at this point. Um, and I'm, you know, so anyway. I'm going to, I'm, I, I can't support it at this time. Thanks, Frank. Further comments from the council? I had a question, uh, Dana, or perhaps Angie. So the last time we adjusted these fees was back in 2007, so about 11 years ago. If you apply, you know, a reasonable inflationary index of 3% per year, you could certainly justify a 20% increase in the total impact fee package that you're um, recommending. I do as well get a little bit hung up on the fact that we're increasing, despite my love for the paved trails, we're increasing that specific fee 197% compared to what was adopted in 2007. I think it's unfortunate we didn't do incremental bumps along the way, which we're learning on a lot of our different fees that the city imposes. And it represents about 16% of the total impact fee package that we're going to be adopting. My question, and something I'll throw out to the council is, can that impact fee for paved trails be incrementally bumped up over the next five years, or do we have to lock it down now and hold it till 2023 when we review the impact fees again? Can we do a scaled inflationary approach? Mm -hmm. Yep, so it's really, and that's why we're looking for direction, because it's really um, up to you guys. If you want to do, you know, start with 25 and get up to 50 in five years, or you want to start at 50 and get up to 100% in five years. It's really just the direction of, you know, after your public comment, uh, where, where you'd like to go. Um, you know, when we talk about impact fees for affordability, uh, there are some states that do have a waiver for impact fees for affordability. So if somebody wants to champion a bill at the legislature in two years, I would say that's the best way. Otherwise, most states require that cities come up with a, a different funding source to pay for them. So I think that's an important part when we do talk about affordability. Um, we'll have to have other funding sources to pay for them at this point because Montana does not allow just the waiver for affordability. Well, I just I throw that out there for the council's consideration. I mean, I, I completely agree with Andy and all the points that he made that I'm also optimistic that, you know, given our bike ped master plan and we're looking out how long, 
Maria, for the full 20 years with the resort tax reappropriation in 2025. At our retreat, we discussed obviously the need to increase the percentage of the total resort tax collection that goes to parks for these very types of projects. And so I'm optimistic that we're gonna have an alternative funding stream in the near future to help offset uh, the impact fees, just from my perspective. So I'll throw that out there for consideration to, the, uh, to Katie who made the original motion. I would like to amend my motion. <laughs> I'd like to amend the motion to adopt all of the impact fees starting, except for the paved trails, starting with 25% and sliding up to 50% within the five years. Is that okay with the second? Who was the second? That was me. Ryan. That's fine. Okay. Further discussion on the motion? I can support that. Thanks, Andy. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed, like sign. And the motion carries on a four to one vote with uh, Councillor Hartman voting in opposition. Can I just get clarification sure. on that? So that would be starting at 25, moving up to 50. Over a five year over period. Over the five year period, 5%. Okay, yeah. perfect. Starting, I just wanted to make sure I understood it. Starting January 1st, 2019, if I oh, did perfect. not reiterate that for the record. Perfect. Thank Thanks, you. Dana. Thank Appreciate it. Do you have Adam's report and close with the packet? Any questions for our city manager? Not seeing any. Adam, anything to report on not included in the packet? A little bit of the snow lot stuff, but uh, Katie did that, so Great. we're moving full steam ahead there. Great. Thanks, Adam. We'll start with councillor comments. Andy, would you like to start tonight? I have nothing. Thanks. Ryan? Nothing. Katie? Nothing. Frank? I will just simply uh, invite everyone to, uh, who has any interest in horse activities at all to attend the event at Rebecca Farms It's this week. It is the premier event um, in the country in, in many ways. It's the largest event of its kind in the country and maybe in the world. Um, to have that in this valley and to have that activity in this valley to, to, it supports a lot of things in this valley is, is a tremendous thing. Um, I will admit that I am a participant and I do love it, but it is quite a spectacle. So anybody that's listening and has any, any question about it at all, I'd say wander out. It's free to the public. Great. Good luck. Melissa. No comment. Thanks, Melissa. I'll be quick. Um, I sent two letters out. Uh, Richard picked up on a few typos, so I modified those, but you'll see those in your inbox. One was a letter of support. Uh, for the Flathead Basin Commission's uh, proposed septic study bill. I believe Mike Copel and a host of individuals will be traveling over to meet with the Interim Water Policy uh, Committee in Helena um, tomorrow. So I submitted a letter um, on behalf of the council in support of that bill. Um, I also was asked to submit a letter of support for Glacier Nordic Club's um, conditional use permit to Flathead County. Uh, they're looking to expand the parking off Haskell Basin Road to provide additional parking stalls as well as extend uh, the portion of, of trails that are groomed down to connect in with the parking lot. I think it'll be a win-win because it'll help alleviate the pressure up at the Big Mountain um, Road Trailhead and Stoltz is certainly uh, supportive of the CUP as well as Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks because it certainly you know conforms to our uh, easement. Um, so you'll see those two letters. Um, striping, Craig, I've... <laughs> Heard some talk in town about uh, the need to perhaps address some of the striping on some of our more uh, publicly used uh, roadways, in particular uh, Baker. And I was just curious, is that a city responsibility or DOT? And is it scheduled for this summer? Uh, yeah, Baker is a city-maintained roadway, um, at least from 19th to 2nd. Okay. And it is scheduled. I'm hoping that... Um, most of those long lines will be done on Baker by the end of this week. Um, they've spent quite a bit of time uh, doing parking stalls and other painting downtown, but we realize those long lines need to be addressed. So, Understood. It's a long that. list, so yeah. appreciate if you could get to it this summer. That'd be great. Um, lastly, I think we bring this up every uh, summer. I was sitting on my deck on Saturday night, and lo and behold, I could hear the MC from the lodge, the event that was going on at the lodge. I could literally hear verbatim every word that the MC was 
speaking into the mic, and I live all the way up on Idaho Avenue, a couple miles from the lodge. I can't imagine what it was like at your house, Andy. Um, followed by music, and they shut down promptly at 10 p.m. But uh, Dave, I would, I know that we don't have decibel criteria for our noise ordinance, and I know Bill, we've talked about this extensively over the years. I still think it's something we need to look at, and I know enforcement's an issue, but I feel for those folks that live in Monks Bay and adjacent to the lodge, I do not think it's fair for folks to not be able to enjoy the privacy of their backyard in the summer and have endless interruptions coming from the lodge and other facilities in our town. I don't know if there's something we can look into. Hello, Chief Dial. We responded to that and they had their speakers turned out towards the lake okay. and they assured us in the future that they would turn the speakers back in towards the building and that should eliminate part of it. So um, that was the biggest issue. Okay. Well, I appreciate you responding uh, to that call. I inevitably get calls. I'll admit it. I had from one individual who actually sat up here for several terms who lives in that neighborhood. So um, if I continue to hear additional complaints, I'd, I'd like to at least have uh, planning department, you know, address the lodge uh, directly uh, for their noise. But thanks to the police chief for um, responding to that call. On that note, I have nothing further. How about staff? Council? Thanks, we are adjourned.